Okay, welcome back to the uh, next session here. Let's begin with uh, a question. Uh, yes, Kennedy. Okay, thank you. My question was, was uh, why preach to the dead? Is that not practice uh, spiritism? Because the dead are, con are conscious of, of nothing. Thank you. Why preach to the dead? As we have clarified, preaching is declaration of what is happening and the fact that from that point onwards, those who were captives or those who were seen as being imprisoned, right? They are now set free. So declaration was um, uh, thought necessary. So that is the preaching that we are talking about. And to say that, you know, one who is dead is not conscious wouldn't be right. Because if you look at uh, what the Bible describes about those who are dead, we know that they are very much alive. Their spirit is very much alive and they are, uh, they do have awareness. And so for whatever reason, God thought it was important to declare to them the work of Jesus. So that's how we look at this. Is that OK? Or do you still have any questions? We we no longer do then, that. Yeah, tell me. Is there any support of us in the Bible that they are aware? That they are aware. Okay. Sure, just a moment, please. Sir, is someone speaking? I don't no, know if no, I'm no, here. No, nobody, nobody is speaking anything. Okay. So I was just looking up, uh, you know, some scriptures to share with Kennedy. Fine. So directly to, you know, state that they are alive, uh, there's no, like, you know, like a direct scripture. But we can, of course, look at the story from Luke chapter 6, where people were dead. You had the rich man and Lazarus who were dead, isn't it? Uh, but you find that there is an account of their life after death. The rich man particularly, when he says that, you know, that he is suffering to go and inform his relatives, the message he gets is, they already have enough prophets. They already have enough people to talk to them. So that in itself gives us the understanding that they are aware of what is going on. They were aware of their environment. They were also aware of the occurrences on the earth. Okay, So that that is uh, something that helps us. Now, in addition to that, when we look at passages like 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8, uh, Paul says, 
absent from the body and to be present with the lord so you know that that shares how one goes from this reality to another reality a spiritual reality but it does not really specify that we have lost awareness okay we we have it we just move the spirit continues to be alive and it has the capability of awareness else how would you how would you recognize that you know you're not here and you're there so there is a sense of awareness um and even later when you read passages uh, like first thessalonians 4 verses 16 and 17 you recognize that the dead will come back they will come back so there, there are things that are going on in the other realm uh, there are many things that are going on in the other realm and there is a there is a schedule so to speak after which you know god will even bring them during the rapture they will come the trumpet will blow uh, and and so there are things that are going on they are also aware of the uh, timeline of the earth like what exactly uh, is happening here and they will participate in the things that will take place so uh, if people were not conscious if people were disconnected i don't think all these all these truths will be revealed uh, in in the bible kennedy so uh, does that help you do these uh, passages help you? Uh, do, do they convince you that they are conscious or they're not okay, convinced? Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, so there, there's right. actually much more. I didn't give you very direct passages, but uh, yeah, it's true that one who's dead is aware. Okay. Thank you, Shavu. Okay, sure. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, now moving on to First Peter chapter five. Okay, let's see uh, what are some themes that have been addressed here. So, firstly, to the leaders, uh, he uses the term elders. So. I remember we talked about how the church administration, the church leadership structure emerges, evolves, changes over a period of time. So at this point, they have elders. So that's why Peter says the elders. And he also says, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. So that reveals his humility, that though he is an apostle, uh, in in he is walking in sync with the leadership of the church. Others may be, if you want to call it an hierarchy, others are kind of, um, you know, they they are lower uh, in, in the order. And yet he says, I'm a fellow elder with you. So a very humble way of introducing himself. He says, we are partakers of the glory that will be revealed. Then instruction to the leaders, church leaders shepherd the flock of god who are the flock of flock of god god's people they are called as the flock so the comparison is um, shepherd and um, sheep the way jesus i mean god said right the lord is my shepherd david has said some so shepherd the flock of god uh, which is among you serving as overseers now he points out qualities that elders should have or leaders should have he says not by compulsion but willingly you know how sad it would be if a leader had to be pushed to do their task pushed to take care take care of your people you know share god's word to your people um minister to them through the gifts of the spirit so one should not come to a place in their ministry where they are so you know tired and they've given up that they need to be pushed to do these things instead he says do it willingly so a good leader would do it willingly uh, that's a quality that we can desire the second thing is he says not for dishonest gain but eagerly so notice contrasting things there we are not doing it to get something whether that is fame or money or uh, you know any other thing we're not doing it for those wrong reasons but eagerly because we know that it is going to benefit the body of christ it is going to glorify god so those are the motives which help us or which drive us
to serve God's people. So do it in that manner. What else? Not as lords over those who are entrusted, but being examples to the flock. So we must not boss over. In other words, you know, that's our kind of language. Don't boss over God's people. Instead, lead like a an example. And that is what uh, we, we find Jesus do. You know, it's like uh, this servant leadership where Jesus lived a life and the, that's why you had disciples who followed the life example of Jesus. And later Paul writes, imitate me as I imitate Christ. So it's about imitating. And so whenever we talk about leadership, leadership is to be an example. When we are an example, people can follow. Don't boss over them. Instead, be an example. And how beautiful. Over those entrusted to you. So always look at people whom we are serving as uh, God's, what do you say? God has given those people to us for, for us to steward them. So they don't belong to us. You know, sometimes we we uh, we have things and we, we have our own uh, stuff and we feel like we own it. But in this case, we are just stewards because whose people are they? They are God's people. God has entrusted, notice the word they entrusted to you. So when we care for people, let's remember they are God's people. We have been given for whatever period of time, a responsibility to take care of them. And so we have to do it in a good way. What is that good way? Willingly, eagerly being examples to the flock. So that's the right kind of leadership. So when we do that, what is it that we are going to get? When the chief shepherd appears, so we, there may be pastors and, you know, leaders over the church, but ultimately there is the greatest pastor or the greatest uh, shepherd, who is that? Our Lord Jesus Christ. When he appears, there is a reward. What is that reward? So many rewards Peter talks about. He seems to be the kind who says, don't worry, you're going to get something later. Don't worry, you're going to get some. If you're going to, going through persecution, don't worry. You know, uh, something beautiful is going to be revealed. The same way, if our leadership is a godly leadership, we will receive the crown of glory. And this crown of glory, it's an eternal reward, reward, and thereby he specifies a quality. It will not fade away. It will not fade away. It's not like an earthly medal. So that's an encouragement to us as leaders, to the shepherds. Now, the next section, he goes on to say that one must submit to God. Submit to God. Be in submission to God. So... Uh, and because we are submitted to God, he, he says in verse 5, those who are younger, submit yourself to your elders. Uh, yes, all of you be submissive to one another. Be clothed with humility. So in those days, apparently slaves would be marked by a kind of, a you know, like a shawl or an apron, which they used to use. And that's why this terminology, be clothed with humility, like one who is serving. Uh, you you be committed in that manner. So there is submission. Submission to the elder people. Submission to one another. Being clothed with humility. Because we are ultimately what? Submitted to God. And that, that's what he, he is, his emphasis is. He says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. We've talked about this while doing James. So you see all the, one beautiful uh, thing we can recognize is James wrote and so did Peter but it's not contradictory this what Peter said be of one mind you can see that among the leaders they are not against each other their writings are not against each other they had the same mindset the word of God this is the truth this is what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do. So we all agree on these matters. So even Peter, he says, God resists the proud, but God gives grace to the humble. So he says, we need to uh, walk in humility with one another you know, as part of our uh, Christian uh, community life. Now, he says, when we do this, when we humble ourselves, then what happens? At the right time, God will exalt us. So 
when we humble ourselves, it's a test of faith because we may not see the exaltation right away. But if we hold on, surely at the right time, God is a God who will lift up the humble. And uh, he says, uh, as you go through different, different challenges, you just cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. So here, cast your cares is a way of saying, throw. You know, when we are very burdened and uh, we, we find a place where we can put those things away, what do we generally do? We'll just take off the heavy bag and just put it there. Sometimes even just throw it there. So in that way, he says, God cares for us so much. You don't carry your own burdens, but know that there will be a due time where God will exalt you when you're humble. Just throw all your cares, your anxieties upon the Lord because God cares for you. Now, along the same theme of submission he says uh, you know you submit yourself to god right and you resist the devil okay so let's see how he puts it he says be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour resist him steadfast in the faith knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world so the way james uh, spoke to us earlier similar He's, he's talking about, uh, you know, going against the devil. But obviously, it would begin with our submission to God. Uh, and he says, the enemy is worth resisting. How do we resist? Steadfast in the faith. Okay, Faith is a shield. As long as we, we are standing in faith, we can overcome the enemy. So resist him steadfast in the faith. Knowing um, and try to understand that these things, these sufferings that believers are going through, it, it is but common. We're all going through, we're all experiencing, he says, same sufferings, persecution, opposition, um, you know, many other things that, that come to us, temptations. We're all going through the same sufferings, but resist the devil. And then he um, goes on to say, May the God of all grace, who called us to eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So he uses a term, suffered a while. Why? Because his one of the common ways he's looking at things through the entire writing of First Peter uh, is that this life is but temporary, and uh, we are all going to step into eternal life. So today's sufferings are nothing because there is a glory which we are going to receive. So that's why he says, suffered a while, God is there. He will continue to strengthen you out of those sufferings. And then he exalts God um, uh, it, towards the end of what he's saying. He says, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And finally, the farewell notes here. He says, by Sylvanus. Remember, I said that when he wrote this uh, letter, he has taken the help of Silas. Silas was also known as Sylvanus. Uh, by Sylvanus, a faithful brother, as I considered him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. So why do you think he has taken the help of uh, uh, Sylvanus here in writing the letter? Why not just write it the way Paul did? Any any thoughts on that? He's a Christian man, an unlearned man, ma'am. Maybe he was dictating. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So because Peter is a, he's not a learned man like Paul. He needed somebody to support him as he wrote this literary piece. And that's why he took the help of uh, Silas. Yes. I I, I was all, I, I I have also heard that uh -huh. uh, the book of Mark is actually supposed to be, or rather, the Gospel of Mark is actually the Gospel of Peter. That Peter was actually narrating to Mark all his encounters with Jesus. Um, but because Mark wrote it. And that's why it's accounted to him. But in actual fact, I don't know if you've heard that, but I've heard that uh, because I think if we go down, it says, Mark, my son, in verse 13, greets you, greets you. So I, um, Mark kind of took 
narration of all that Peter witnessed with Jesus to come up with the gospel of Mark. I, I don't know if you've heard that, but I've just heard that. I just wanted to point out in relation to the fact that he said Peter was um, was not learned like Paul, so he needed people to help, right? So I, I don't know if you've heard that too. So. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing, uh, Say I, I haven't heard it. I think uh, here in this book, we can substantiate it by the passage because there's a scripture that says by Sylvanus. So we can confirm it. Uh, I'm not too sure about Mark because that is a little bit, you know, speculative. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right, Pastor. Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay, so uh, he took the help of uh, Silas. Now, the other part here, he says, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you. So elect together with you is who? We talked about elect earlier. Who's elect? Those chosen, those chosen, Correct. those who have accepted to follow Jesus, basically. Correct. So when he says, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, who, who do you think he might be referring to? She greets you. Any guesses? Just to guess, anybody? I uh, can't hear you because of my headphones. Sorry? John's mother. Okay. So uh, there's uh, an opinion. John's mother. Any any other any other thoughts? She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you. Who is the she? Make his wife. I believe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that other guess. Good, good, interesting. I'm just checking because you're doing all the books of the Bible, your batch, how you were interpreting. Is it uh, like a remnant? A remnant. Okay. Okay. Divya, thank you. Thank you for that. Any other views? Okay, I think uh, I, I'll I'll just share the answer. So, elect together with you, believers, believers from Babylon. So she is church. Yeah, correct. So uh, he's just using the term she to describe a church in Babylon because we talk about the church as the bride and all, right? So. That's the context. In Babylon, now to understand this, uh, again, you know, commentators say that Peter was actually writing from uh, a Babylon during his times. But then others say that he wasn't uh, literally writing from Babylon, but he was writing from Rome or from Jerusalem. But he called those places as Babylon because of the, the uh, depth of sin in those uh, places by now. So it was as good as Babylon, the things that were going on in those places. And that's why he terms it as Babylon. But ultimately, what he's saying is that the church, I think maybe it was a church in Jerusalem. So he just brought greetings of the church. Uh, that's why he says, elect together with you, chosen, just like how you're chosen. All the people are chosen. Uh, he just brings greetings. Uh, or their greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So uh, with that, he ends his first episode. Uh, yes? Uh, yeah, just to buttress your point, you're actually right. Uh, the complete Jewish Bible says, your sister congregation in Babel. Babel mm -hmm. was also another name for Babylon. 
-hmm. He says she meant the church. That's what he said, correct? Are, are we correct? Yeah. Yeah, yes. So it says in the CJB, the complete Jewish Bible says, your sister congregation in Bavel, which okay. which is in line. Okay. 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 Yeah, right. I, I was just buttressing what you were saying. That's okay. Yes. Thank you for that. Thank yes. you. All right. Um, sure. So now, like, we can go ahead to uh, the next passage here, which would be Second Peter. Second Peter. Chapter 1. Let's go through the entire uh, entire chapter. If somebody can please go ahead and read it. And I'll just share the themes in this first chapter and then move on to the second chapter. So primarily what we will see here, this was also written somewhere around 67 AD. Uh, and Peter, so far, he talked about persecution, which is coming up, and how the believer should be strong, how the believer should have a different lifestyle compared to an unbeliever, how the believer must understand that they are chosen and that they have all these eternal blessings. And finally, you know, a lot about uh, submission submission in various uh, various spheres that you know one could be a part of some instructions for community life and then uh, the greeting and he ends but here the core theme is warning warning against apostasy where uh, he just like john apostle john wrote about people who will come up who will neither will they preach the right message nor will they live out that right message so be alert about such people and don't follow their example uh, so that is what will come through from second peter the book is actually a warning to believers uh, against uh, such people and you'll also notice that it's easy for us to study second peter and the book of jude together the theme is the same even jude warns about these false apostles right these false teachers and, and uh, false leaders and so be alert be alert uh, regarding these people so that would be the core of what we are going to see in this book of second peter so let's read a uh, chapter 1 please somebody read the entire passage that will be great uh, can I read, Pastor? Yes, Christopher. Second Peter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ have received a faith as precious as ours. <clears throat> Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for our godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith, goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual aff affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
uh, thank you, Christopher. Okay, fine. So let's uh, go ahead with this, and then I'll I'll come back to the remaining part. Uh, that that's quite long already. Uh, this passage. Fine. So let's uh, start off from verses one to verse four. It's a greeting and a reminder about how we are empowered. We've already received his his greeting is there grace and peace be multiplied to you and then he introduces himself without any doubt he says apostle and bond servant remember bond servant we said it's like slave uh, this is the same peter who denied jesus he ran away but then after the resurrection and with the infilling of the holy spirit look at the transformation that has taken place he's become a brave bold witness for the lord jesus he even calls himself bond servant on servant apostle of the lord jesus and then you know he goes on to talk about the uh, inheritance he says his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness okay through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue so we already have the power which we need basically in these two verses we recognize that we have the power to live that according to that divine nature that God wants us to have. So as a believer, we don't have to be tainted or you know uh, uh, have blemishes from the engaging in the world, right? So being corrupted by the world, that doesn't need to happen to a believer because we have the power for everything pertaining to life and godliness uh, through knowing our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, we have exceedingly great and precious promises through which we can partake of the divine nature okay, and having escaped the corruption of the world. So in simple words, a believer can live a holy life and escape the filth of the world because we are empowered uh, through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, we have everything that we need to overcome. So that's uh, that's Peter's way. Even earlier, he talked about spiritual truths. You know, you are uh, you are a chosen uh, generation. You are a special people. You are a whole you know royal priesthood. So he likes to remind people about their spiritual reality, and he's doing that right at the start in a second epistle as well then he goes on to encourage the believer to keep growing so this is also so crucial in the life of believers remember in first peter he talked about the sincere milk of the word grow thereby by the sincere milk of the word now again he says if a believer is not in constantly our state should be growing in the present continuous tense if it is not that and we say that i've grown something would be wrong so we should be growing in the lord so how does growth look he says keep adding new virtues to the character that we already have so he says giving all diligence add to your faith virtue so we are saying we have faith but then godly character virtue virtue is very very important Okay. Then he says to virtue knowledge. Now we may we may display a, a, a godly uh, lifestyle, a godly way of responding to situations and circumstances, but that shouldn't be from a place of ignorance. A believer should also be well informed of the things of God, which is why today you know all of us are learning, we are studying because yes, we want to. We, we want to have faith, but uh, accompanied with faith, we want to have a godly character. Then we should also have knowledge of God, the things of God. Now, just having that is not sufficient. He says, come on, to that you add self-control. Remember, James said self-control, a man who is able to bridle his tongue. Uh, he's able to bridle his he's able to control his whole body so there is something about growing in self control you know as as an individual as a disciple of god and that's very important uh, for a believer so these all of this should be a part of one's lifestyle uh, and and he's pointing these things out self control then he says perseverance so yes now we are demonstrating self control but then when there are trials there are uh, uh, tribulations not giving up easily 
but being strong enough to go through those trials with a positive attitude that's also crucial so he says have perseverance ha with perseverance have godliness what is godliness it's a devoted heart and a devoted life where you know everything is as as unto the lord everything is as we are a living sacrifice this body is a living sacrifice to the lord so godliness being set apart for god uh, uh, being holy unto the lord so this is our understanding when when he talks about godliness uh, and then the way john says if one says that uh, you know i i uh, love god but i don't love my brothers how is it useful so then he says yes now we now that we know we need all these aspects uh, also know that you need to be kind to one another so brotherly kindness uh, and to brotherly kindness love so ultimately when there is love uh, everything sort of falls in place right just the way even paul pointed out in uh, he he talked about um, love in that entire passage of first corinthians chapter 13 that the greatest of these is love so undergirding everything with love that's when the believer is actually living a full life otherwise what happens it's you know it, it's a little funny it's somewhat like um I shudder to use certain terms, uh, but you know, like a double-faced life where we we believe one thing but we live something completely different. Uh, that that is not right in the sight of God or a good testimony to people around us. And, and Peter is giving us a beautiful uh, description of how a real believer should be, should have all these things as a part of his growing spiritual walk with the Lord. What else does he add to that? He says, if at all you have these things and not a little bit of this, but you abound in these things, then what happens? You will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our God, Jesus Christ. So he says, this is a fruitful Christian walk okay this is a, a thriving Christian walk and when we have this kind of a walk when it comes to us knowing the Lord more and more right that will also be effective our knowing of God will be effective when we pursue a full life in this manner however he points to a scenario where uh, there is no such growth so then what happens for he who lacks these things is short-sighted, he says. Okay? Meaning somebody who professes God but doesn't have a life to match it up. He is, he uses the term short-sighted, meaning he doesn't have proper understanding. He doesn't have good understanding. And he also calls, he says, even blindness because he has actually forgotten why that he has been cleansed. Okay, so why did Jesus sacrifice himself and uh, uh, give us this salvation so that there can be a life that is transformed, isn't it? But if that is not the case, he says, then it's like you've forgotten the very reason why Jesus died for our sins. So the second section is primarily an encouragement. Keep growing in God have all these aspects as part of a believer's life. Then. If I say I'm trying to know God better, I'm trying to understand him better, it makes sense. But otherwise, if we are saying we are trying to know God better, but we don't have a godly life to go with it, then, you know, there is there is a conflict over that. OK, then he says, uh, make your uh, be diligent to make your call and election sure. So I just want to uh, state as we've been saying time and time again, when you see standalone passages that seem to put the emphasis on works compared to grace, we already know that that cannot be so because ultimately we are all saved by grace, right? Through faith. So here all he's saying is come, let faith be accompanied by good deeds and a godly life. So that is how. We would interpret that. Okay, now coming to the next two sections. Uh, can somebody kindly read verse 12 to verse 21? For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you. Okay, continue, Ashna. Continue, continue. 
No, no, I think, Avni, you can uh, read this time since Asha has had a couple of chances today. She should be fine. Okay. Okay, no problem. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. A prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Avni. Let's go now to this uh, passage. So here, from verses 12 to 15, he he is talking about something known as the present truth. So I, I just want to clarify that. Be established in the present truth. So he's reminding the believers of all these important uh, uh, aspects. But when he says the present truth, it means that you know, the word of God has not changed, but in a, a, a given period of time, God may be giving deeper insights you know, regarding a matter. For example, when we uh, take um, the 1900s, early 1900s, uh, Holy Spirit baptism, the uh, operation and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it was already in the Bible you know, for thousands of years. But something about that truth came to life uh, and you know we we talk about a revival we talk about a move of god so present truth is that today the holy spirit may be laying emphasis and giving deeper revelations and insights regarding a matter that is the present truth now it does not change the written word of God. That we must be very clear about. It will not contradict the written word of God, but it will just help us get a deeper understanding. And uh, that's what Peter is saying. That be established in the present truth. What is God saying to you? You could also look at it like, you know, the prophetic word for today. In, in a, a larger prophetic word to the uh, you know body of Christ, to the larger community of believers. So present truth. That's the meaning of it. Okay, uh, and then he indicates that he is going to die shortly. So, uh, you know, those who walk with the Lord, like even Paul seems to do that. He seems to say, uh, he seems to predict that uh, I, I'm not going to be around too long. He received that, you know, he received uh, prophetic words about him being captured uh, by the Romans uh, and all. And maybe it was due to prophetic words that God gave them. But in this case, uh, Paul also says, he uses the terminology tent. I am in this tent. Okay, So the body is but a tent. It's a vessel that we need to live uh, and glorify God in the on the earth. Uh, and you know, Paul, uh, Peter says that he will put off his tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. So uh, God has spoken to him that he's going to die, that physical death is going to take place sometime around. And we read um, about the death of Peter. We are told that he he was uh, 
uh, martyred also and uh, that he chose to be crucified upside down is what uh, history tells us uh, why upside down you know commentators say that uh, he did not he, he felt that he's too small like he humbled himself uh, and he never wanted to even compare with jesus jesus was crucified in a straight way right but then uh, he felt like a servant of the lord who did not deserve to be crucified the way jesus was and that's why he requested to be crucified upside down uh, to demonstrate his humility and and that's how he was martyred is is what you know uh, uh, history says okay uh, and he brings reminders to the believers so that they stay in the word of god and he talks about how he brought the word to them as an eyewitness even john apostle john said that these people were with jesus so he's saying these are not cunning devised fables but as eyewitnesses of his majesty we have declared things to you and then he talks about the prophetic word of god how god gives a word but he confirms it uh, and he talks about the fact that prophetic word or prophecy is something which is inspired by god so where does a prophetic word come from what is the origin of a prophetic word it's not from the thoughts of man but it is from the heart of god so he says prophecy never came by the will of man but holy men of god spoke as they were moved by the holy spirit so by inspiration of the holy spirit prophetic words were uh, declared prophetic words were spoken and today you have seen you know, the fulfillment of uh, many things one more uh, point that uh, he states in verse 20 is knowing this first that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation so he uses the terminology prophecy of scripture so one more thing that we can be aware of is actually the whole bible is prophecy why because it's not from the thoughts of man but it's from the thoughts of god and that is why he says when we read uh, the bible what is the real meaning of what is being said here it's not nancy's opinion it's not you know i'm just using some names asha's opinion navni's opinion it shouldn't be that because what what is it it is from the mind of god from the heart of god so the prophecy of scripture is of any private inter no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation so the real interpretation of scripture should be what god has intended what the holy spirit is affirming in agreement to what god has intended so that is the right interpretation for those of us who uh, read the bible and want to get its meaning we must ensure that the meaning that we are receiving is the actual meaning that god want god intended so one good way is let scripture interpret scripture isn't it so all these uh, principles we learn in uh, hermeneutics uh, so any unclear passage should be interpreted uh, in the light of clear passages so with that i'm going to stop there are two more passages uh, of second peter uh, two more chapters and the book of jude which essentially have the same theme so what i'll do is i'll do a one hour recording okay and uh, i will have it uh, uploaded for all of us uh, you can just go over that whenever you are free and uh, that should be fine with that we conclude our course here in the book of hebrews um, and yeah any further discussions chats it can always go on on our a google classroom stream page uh, we will close for now so yeah would anyone like to please pray okay siddhant Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for the word which we have received, Lord. 
Thank you for helping us to understand and receive. Thank you for all things here. Lord, I pray that you will divide the word of truth rightly. You will do everything with your grace, Lord. Help us to understand more, go deeper into your word. Lord, we thank you for this day, for all the classes. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for connecting to all these classes. I really hope that you were blessed by them.